Uh, you remember that's how I began the lecture series, reminding you this might be a particularly significant uh, election, possibly an election for all the marbles, possibly an election in which um, uh, each party had a chance of winning not just the presidency, but the House, the Senate, and the judiciary uh, running the table, and one party did do just that, but it did do just that even though it lost the national popular vote for the presidency. Um, and you might wonder how um, uh, such a thing could happen, and it's because of the Electoral College, and this chapter, chapter nine, really um, is an a exploration of the Electoral College. We've talked about this already to some extent. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about how chapter nine came to be. Remember, this book collects various newspaper op-eds that I've written over the last two decades. Um, and uh, in the immediate run-up to the election of 2000, I had a premonition that there might be an electoral college inversion, by which I mean the popular vote and the electoral college vote might actually um, uh, diverge, such that the person who won the popular vote might lose the electoral college. Um, so, um, and happily, um, in some ways, uh, just for my reputation, I said so in all sorts of public places, including on MSNBC, on national television, so I'm on record as predicting that before the election of 2000. Here's one op-ed uh, that I wrote. This was on October 21st, 2000. Here's how it ended. Last but not, so this is two weeks before the election of 2000, the Bush v. Gore race. Quote, last but not least of the democratic accidents waiting to happen, the man who loses, there was two men, the man who loses the national popular vote next month might nonetheless win the electoral vote. If this doesn't happen next month, one day, statistically, it will. When it does, will the loser winner have the requisite democratic legitimacy at home and abroad? If not, why are we waiting for this tire to blow rather than acting via constitutional amendment to fix the system before it crashes? Um, so that was on October 21st in Slate. Then the next week, um, on November 2nd, that was a Thursday, still about four days, five days before the election, I wrote another piece, and here's how I ended that. Our current, this is a quote, our current systems of presidential selection and succession are a mess. Various accidents and crises waiting to happen. Why not amend the Constitution and provide for direct popular election for all future presidential contests? And then as the election came even closer, I, I became even more uh, uneasy about what was likely to happen. So the day before the election, I wrote up two op-eds. Um, a, a red version and a blue version, because I had a feeling that there was going to be an inversion, but I didn't know which way it would go. I thought actually there was a possibility that Al Gore could lose the popular vote but win the Electoral College, and a possibility that George, as it turns out, what happened, George W. Bush could lose the popular vote but win the Electoral College. If you had asked me, so I wrote up two versions, um, and then the next day the New York Times called uh, after the election, this is before Florida became a madhouse, and it seemed that Bush had actually won Florida, and that there was, but that Gore had won the national popular vote, and did I have anything to say about that? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, and I pushed the button and sent them the, the prophetic um, red version of, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, of this op-ed that I had that I had written. But if you had asked me the day before the election, I would have said, I think there's maybe a 10, 15% chance that there could be an inversion. But if there's an inversion, probably, I think actually it's more likely to favor Gore than Bush. You know, let's say that it's a 15% chance there's an inversion. 10% chance it's gonna actually favor Gore, excuse me, it's more likely to favor Gore. 10% chance it's going to favor Gore, only a 5% chance it's going to favor Bush, which is a reminder. See, the, 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 the 
candidates are not trying to win the popular vote. And if the popular vote were the, the thing to be, um, uh, the, 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 the the, the, dis, uh, the thing that actually decides who wins and who loses, both candidates would have run somewhat different races. It, for example, in a popular vote scenario, George Bush would have tried to run up the score um, in Texas, and Al Gore would have um, been um, less impolite about Texas. He wouldn't have messed with Texas to the same extent. He could mess with Texas because he knew he was going to lose and it didn't matter if he lost by 1% or 10%. But in a national popular vote system, it actually, every state's a swing state and it, ma it, it matters whether you win or lose a state in a squeaker or in a blowout. So, so you change the rules, you change the game to some extent. But back in 2000, I thought that there was a pretty good likelihood of an inversion. And if you'd forced me to bet, I would have actually bet that the inversion would favor Al Gore. So I got it close to right, but not 100%. Um, Jeff Greenfield, by the way, got it 100% right. He's a, he's a great political pundit and journalist, and we talked about this uh, in the week before the election. And he thought there would be an inversion and that it would favor uh, Bush. Okay. Now flash forward to 2004, George W. Bush is running for re-election. In that race, he beats John Kerry at the end of the day by about three million votes nationally. That's pretty substantial. But he wins Ohio only by about 50,000 votes. And if he had lost Ohio, John Kerry would have won in the Electoral College, even though John Kerry would still have lost the national popular vote by a, a very substantial margin. Imagine John Kerry had been actually an Ohio senator rather than a Massachusetts senator, or had some special connection to Ohio, or some, for some reason or other was particularly attractive to the good people of Ohio. Well, he, so everything else pretty much the same, but he just happens to be especially popular in Ohio, that's where he was born or where his spouse is from, or, um, or, um, or again, imagine he was a senator from that state. Why do I mention those things? I mention those things because you might think, now that the Electoral College has once again resulted in a divergence, an inversion between the popular vote winner and the electoral vote winner, you might think, gee, the current system is really tilted, skewed against the Democrats. It, it screwed them in 2000, the Electoral College. It screwed them again last um, and earlier this month. I myself don't quite think that there's a systematic skew in the Electoral College. It, it could have favored Gore in 2000. It could have favored Kerry in 2004. Um, yes, going into this election, the really great statisticians like Nate Silver we're predicting the possibility of an inversion and an inversion that would favor Trump and not Clinton. But I'm not sure that that's, that would have been true of any Republican running against any Democrat, um, according to, I think, the best statisticians. And I think Nate Silver was much closer to calling it right than just about anyone else around, and, and, and props to him. Um, and, and he was criticized by many others as, as being more pessimistic. But you know that I was paying close attention to him because you know that I was you know, very much a, a, a believer that, that, that uh, either one could win um, and that it was not um, uh, going to be um, just, that it was not a 90% or a 95% uh, uh, likelihood of a, of a Clinton victory. But here's why Nate Silver was um, arguing throughout the election that this time around, with this Democrat running against this Republican, that the Electoral College was, that was tilted somewhat in the Republicans' favor. Because of the, the demographic campaigns and, and strategies that each side pursued. She um, was particularly focused on um, uh, a, a, a 
certain non-white demographic, hoping for especially high turnout, especially among Hispanic Americans. He was going especially for um, um, native white Americans. Now, given that she was focused on Hispanic Americans, you see, Hispanic Americans are not particul a particularly large demographic group in several of the critical swing states. They're not a large group in Ohio. They're not a large group in Pennsylvania. They're not a large group in places that she had to hold as part of her firewall that turned out to be very close and that she lost, like Wisconsin, like Michigan. Um, they were helpful to her in, in Colorado. They were helpful to her in New Mexico. Um, but a lot of the Hispanics that she won, they ended up not, help, not being, she, didn't, um, she wasn't close enough in Arizona for the Hispanics to make the difference. Um, she wasn't remotely close enough in Texas for Hispanics to make the difference. She didn't need all the extra Hispanic votes she got in California. Um, and in Florida, it was a slightly different mix of, of Hispanics and, they didn't, and she wasn't quite able to do the job in Florida. So given that demographic, um, uh, where she ran particularly, where Trump ran particularly well among non-college educated um, native whites, those folks are actually disproportionately represented in a state like Ohio. They're actually um, a pretty substantial portion of the population of Michigan and Wisconsin and even of Pennsylvania. But a different Democrat running against a different Republican, I'm not yet persuaded that today's Electoral College is really, in general, skewed against the Democratic Party. Um, even though it favored the Republicans in 2000, and it favored the Republicans this time around, I think it could just as easily have favored the Democrats in 2000, or in 2004. Um, why do I say that? because the Democratic Party tends to win these days most of the big states in close elections. Seven of the 10 big states in um, Jimmy Carter against Gerald Ford, a race like that, which was close. Um, in Obama against Romney, in Obama against McCain. Democrats win basically seven of the 10 most popular states, and because of winner take all, that's a big bonus for the Democrats in the current electoral college. Winner take all really gives a huge uh, premium to whoever wins these big states. And if the Democrats are winning seven of the top 10, if they're generally winning California and New York and um, uh, uh, running even in Florida, maybe they lose Texas, but they also tend to win Illinois and tend to do pretty well in Pennsylvania um, and Michigan. Well, those are, those are the big states, New Jersey, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Massachusetts. They tend to win, let's say, seven of the big 10. On the other hand, Republicans tend to win more states overall, and that gives them an advantage because every state, no matter how small, gets um, a minimum of three electoral votes. Every state gets a two electoral vote bump up to correspond to the, the fact that each state has two senators. Remember, the number of electoral votes each state gets is the number of House seats plus the number of Senate seats, and every state gets two senators. So Republicans win more states overall, 30 out of 50. Democrats win more big states, seven of the big 10, you know, on balance in the modern era. And, and those two skews roughly offset today. So there are reasons to believe in the direct national election. I believe in it, but they're not partisan reasons. They're not because I think one system favors my party and the other system favors the other party. I believe in direct national election just because I think it's most faithful to a deep American idea of one person, one vote, that everyone's vote counts equally, whether you're in a city or in a suburb or in a rural area, whether you're in California or Wyoming or New York or, or Texas, whether you're a northerner or a southerner, you know, a city slicker or a country mouse, we just count all votes equally. That's how we pick governors in big states states with cities and suburbs and rural areas. And that's how I think ideally we should pick the presidency. 
there are going to be problems if we move to a direct national election system. Uh, you know, as with any reform, Obamacare, Social Security, Medicare, any big reform that you imagine, there are, are possibly going to be unexpected, unanticipated consequences. So the best argument for the Electoral College is just, it's the status quo. It's, it's what we're accustomed to. It's got some problems, but um, we've limped along with it. And, and, and if you switch, you know, because you buy into the argument of some, you know, dreamer, you know, uh, some um, uh, reformer who, who tells you that he's thought about every single thing. He, he hasn't thought about every single thing because no one's smart enough to think of every single thing. And maybe the system, you know, the devil that we know is better than the devil that we don't. That, it seems to me, is the best, really, I'm trying to be fair and balanced, the best argument for the Electoral College. Here are arguments that I don't find particularly persuasive, and you'll see them out there, and they, and this is a little lawyer's phrase, they prove too much. Their logical consequences are, once you think about them, that all the states are stupid. And I don't think states are stupid. I think states are very smart, and we can learn from states. Remember, every state has a mini president called a governor, and that governor in every state is elected basically by direct popular election. One person, one vote. We count the votes um, uh, um, equally, and if it's close, we recount them carefully. That's how we do it. So you'll hear an argument, oh, well, um, the Electoral College avoids a national recount. Well, states manage recounts, and by the way, in 2000, we had to do a recount in Florida and New Mexico and New Hampshire, even though it was clear that there was a national popular vote winner. Um, so I'm not at all sure that a, a national popular vote always generates more recount problems than um, uh, um, the Electoral College does. Then you hear, oh, well, we need the Electoral College because that creates a two-party system. Really? then how come every governor has a two-party system for picking, every state has a two-party system for picking its governor and they don't have an electoral college? And by the way, the electoral college creates the possibility of third-party spoilers, whether it's Evan McMullen in, in Utah um, or Strom Thurmond um, for the Dixiecrats um, in the 1940s or George Wallace in the South in 1968. We had um, uh, Ross Perot, we had um, I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to repress his name, but Ralph Nader, um, just because, you know, he was a spoiler in 2000, and, and if his um, uh, votes had gone to Al Gore, Al Gore would have won Florida going away. Um, so, so I don't think it's the case that the Electoral College generates a two-party system and, um, and, uh, and is necessary for that. States have two-party systems for their governors, and they don't have Electoral College. States manage recounts all the time. Um, oh, we need an electoral college because it wouldn't be fair to rural areas otherwise. The politicians would just focus on racking up lots of votes in big cities. Well, that's true in New York. You know, there's New York City um, and the rest of the state, or that's true in Pennsylvania. And yet, when it comes to governors, California has Los Angeles and San Francisco and lots of, urban, and lots of rural areas, Texas. So if that's a good argument, that we have to give some artificial bonus to people just because they happen to live in the countryside. And by the way, I live in the countryside. I'm a country mouse. But I don't think I, get, I should get any extra credit for living here rather than there. I think the American idea is just no matter where you live, city, countryside, suburb, north, south, east, west, coast, interior, you know, mountain, um, uh, valley, it doesn't matter. Each person gets one vote and only one vote. We count them up. Um, and if it's cl equally and if it's close, we recount them carefully. That's, so, so if the Electoral College is a really a, um, such a great idea for those other reasons, the states are stupid. Uh, um, um, but if instead we have the Electoral College for other reasons, I can explain the system. Here are, are a couple of uh, the real explanations of the Electoral College, and this is what I um, um, uh, explain in more detail in this chapter. I think I told you, but I'll just remind you. In a direct election system, the South loses because slaves can't vote. But if you have an electoral college system, the South gets the benefit of slavery because it gets to, its number, the electors it gets, each state, depend on the number of seats in the House of Representatives 
plus Senate seats and House of Representatives seats are determined by population including slavery. At a discount, a slave counts for three-fifths of a free person, the, the, the infamous three-fifths clause, but in an electoral college system, the South is going to get credit for its slave population, which it wouldn't in a direct election system. And that may not have been clear to everyone at the founding. It was clear to James Madison. At a certain key point in the Philadelphia Convention, this one guy's name is James Wilson, he gets up and he says, let's have direct election. And James Madison says, no, I've done the math, the South loses every time. I'm not, the South's not gonna go for that. He says it that clearly. And he says, it's because you know, a huge portion of our population are slaves and they can't vote, and so we're gonna lose every time. We're not gonna go for that. He says, I, in principle, I, James Madison, think you're right, we should do direct election, but the South is not gonna go for it. Now, Ordinary Americans weren't in the Philadelphia Convention. They might not have heard, they did not have access to that secret conversation, okay? There wasn't anyone hacking into the emails back then, you know, WikiLeaks and, and making that all public. But after, after George Washington passes from the scene, he wins unanimously twice. Every single elector votes for him. When he passes from the scene and we begin to have contested elections, John Adams twice runs against, James, uh, against Thomas Jefferson. And Adams wins the first time and loses the second. And both times it's a northerner against a southerner. And the north votes for the northerner. And the south votes for the southerner. And by that second election, the election of 1800, you know, Thomas Jefferson wins, but it's utterly clear to everyone that he won in part because his electoral votes were padded by slavery. 13 extra electoral votes because those slave states, those southern states that voted for him got extra credit for extra slaves. So by the time of the 1800 election, the electoral college's connection to slavery was obvious to every single American. And we changed the rules of the electoral college in certain respects in a 12th amendment, but we didn't change it, um, the, the slavery skew. Okay. That's two-thirds of what's in the chapter. Here's the final third. Um, one year after, and uh, so, so I just wanted to get, I, I wanted my fellow citizens to know why we have this system. We have it largely because of slavery. That doesn't mean that it, you can't defend it today on other grounds, because we have gotten rid of slavery, of course, and you can defend it just on grounds of inertia. It's the system we have. Um, uh, 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 but if you want to move to direct election, if you believe in that one person, one vote idea, I figured out um, in a way um, that, uh, uh, that there might be ways of moving to direct election that would not require a constitutional amendment. Constitutional amendment is really hard to do. Two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, three-quarters of the states. Um, and um, I hatched two harebrained ideas on the first anniversary of uh, the 2000 election for how Americans could improvise a system of direct election without formally amending the Constitution. One of those became a thing called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Happy to talk about that if you all are interested. Um, um, uh, I mean, you could just um, uh, ask me a question about it and I'll give you um, uh, some details. Another is an even simpler way that in 2020 we could have direct election. Um, uh, basically the parties, the candidates, could agree um, that they are going to play by direct election rules. And, and I'm, I'm still working out some of the details of that, but I floated that idea um, 15 years ago and it actually seems interesting to me today. I'm going to do a, uh, I'm going to um, uh, return to that idea and try to write up an, an op-ed about that. Let me just finally, and then I would just, so let's get the microphones ready, because um, uh, I want to get your comments and questions, remind you of some of the other theories that are out there for why we have the Electoral College. And let me just remind you why I don't find them that persuasive, although other, others do. First, some people say, we have the Electoral College because it's a balance between big states and small states. Well, the House versus Senate is that, 
But one, I don't think America basically has ever been divided between big states and small states. It's divided coasts against the center, cities against um, rural areas, and north against south. And almost all our presidents have been, come from big states. Eight of the first nine presidential elections are won by a Virginian. That's the biggest state. It's consistent with my thesis because Virginia's a slave state. So Virginia is a big slave state, and this is about giving slavery a boost. Pennsylvania in 1800 has more people, free people, more voters than Virginia, fewer electoral votes because because Virginia gets to count all its slaves. So I don't think it's because of big state, small state. And I think I've told you before, let me remind you, you've only had three small state presidents in all of American history. Franklin Pierce, Zachary Taylor, um, Bill Clinton, that's it. Your, all your early presidents are coming from big states. Big states are where it's at. So it's not a big state, small state balance. Then you've heard, oh, well, they don't trust ordinary people um, to, to make this decision. Um, they didn't really believe in democracy. They were concerned about the tyranny of the majority. So they filtered this through this group of wise people who were electors. Well, from the beginning, the electors are, are promising to vote as pledged. They are not wise people making independent determinations. They're, they're nobodies from nowhere who are taking orders from the voters from the very beginning. Um, the Constitution itself prohibits senators and representatives from being electors, and those are your most distinguished people. They have to meet on one day. There's not even time to really deliberate amongst themselves. So from the beginning, um, there, there really has never been an election where the electors are sort of wise people thinking about what would be sensible. They're just registering the preferences pretty much of the voters who picked them from, from um, early on. Um, and the framers did believe in democracy, you see. They put the Constitution to a vote. They created a directly elected House of Representatives, which you did have in the Articles of Confederation. They, they got rid of property qualifications to be a member of the House, the Senate, the presidency. They believed in direct election of governors. Um, so, so they were proud Democrats slash Republicans. Um, the words pretty much mean the same thing. Um, uh, so I don't think that theory is very um, explanatory. Now here's a variant of the theory that is somewhat explanatory. Yes, they believed at the founding that people should vote for members of the House of Representatives and even for governors. But that's because you would know who's good in your state and who's not. But how would you know who's good halfway across the country? Well, at the founding, maybe not, but as soon as political parties come on the scene, you do know who stands for what. And, and, and so um, by 1800, parties have emerged. You've got the Jefferson Party going against the, the John Adams Party. Twice they run against each other. It's North versus South. It's not big state versus small state. Each party stands for a certain philosophy, and ordinary people know which side of that divide they're on. Um, and so by 1800, it's really clear that the, the real consequence of the Electoral College is that it's giving the South an inside track because it's getting extra credit for extra slaves. And yet, we keep that system. Um, so I don't think that the standard stories that we were told in eighth grade, I was taught the same things you were. Oh, it's a balance between big and small state. They don't believe in democracy. Um, um, these are wise elders making the decision. I don't think that those are really very explanatory. I think the most explanatory story is slavery. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to get rid of it because today you might think it, it serves other functions and purposes. I'll tell you one last thing, because sometimes it's the argument is federalism, Professor. States are within the union are really different than, let's say, counties within a state. So when you say, listen, oh, in California there are rural counties and, and they might be outvoted by the big cities, that's different, Professor, than Utah or Wyoming being outvoted by other states because Utah and Wyoming are states in a way that Shasta County in California isn't. It's just a county. And, and states are quasi-sovereign bodies and the Electoral College pays attention to states as states. Okay. But so would a direct election system involve states in interesting ways. In a direct election world, states would actually have incentives to um, make it easier to vote. Because the more people who vote in, let's say, New York, 
the more New York, the bigger the role New York is playing in a national election. In today's world, where there are few New Yorkers show up or a lot of New Yorkers show up, New York gets the same number of electoral votes. But in a direct election world, if the New York government makes it easier for you to vote, the same day registration or making election day a holiday um, or um, early voting or whatever, the more New York makes it easy for you to vote, the more New Yorkers end up voting, the more clout New York would have in a national election system. States would actually have incentives to compete in interesting ways to, to um, encourage democracy and participation. Think about in 1900, the world, some states let women vote in 1908, let's say. Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming, and Utah are the four states that let women vote in 1908. And the other states don't. But now, and in an electoral college system, it doesn't matter whether you let your women vote or not, you get the same number of electoral votes. But in a direct election, alternative universe, any state that lets its women vote is kind of doubling its clout in the national race. That would have creative incentives, I would say good incentives, to expand the franchise. So, so federalism could continue to play a role even in a direct election world, but there are gonna be issues and problems. You're gonna to need to actually have more federal oversight because maybe in a direct election world, states, and this is why unintended consequences of all, you know, um, uh, 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 reform, um, well-intentioned, you know, but possibly misguided reformers like yours truly. Um, so, so in a direct election world, maybe California says, you know what, in order to increase our clout, we're going to let 17-year-olds vote, you know, and Texas says, well, then we're going to let 16-year-olds vote, and then Arkansas says, well, we're going to let dogs vote. Um, and, and you're going to need federal oversight. There's going to be some healthy competition among the states, but you're going to need federal oversight to keep that system, you know, uh, within um, a proper bound. So, so a national election system would require, as a practical matter, much more federal oversight of um, uh, presidential elections than we have currently. Um, and that's basically the chapter. Between 65 and 70% of the population are foreign born. So many people simply cannot vote. So from what you're telling me, we're favored in the electoral college because they're counted. So all sort, yes, the population is counted whether they're allowed to vote or not. Um, and that would be um, today, even for example, people in prison, um, they're part of the census, they add to the electoral vote count even if they don't vote. Um, people who are aliens would be part of the population counted, but they don't vote. Um, so um, uh, it's an interesting observation. Um, uh, so um, some people say the following is like the new three-fifths clause. Remember what the three-fifths clause meant? Because if you're anti-slavery, what number should have been in the Constitution for how slaves count? And you might think, one, everyone's equal. They should count. No, but that would have been even worse because it's not whether slaves are gonna vote. Slaves are never gonna vote. The question is how much extra credit slave states are gonna get in the House of Representatives and the Electoral College because a state has slavery. And the principled anti-slavery answer to that question should be zero. You should never, ever get more votes in the House of Representatives or the Electoral College because you have slavery. So it should be zero. But, so, but, but in fact, it was three-fifths, which meant the more slaves you had in your jurisdiction, maybe you, you, um, the more people you could kidnap in Africa who were born free and ship across the Atlantic in a hellish middle passage in which a third of them are gonna die, see the Amistad, the more you do that, the more seats your state has in the House of Representatives and therefore the Electoral College. It was a bad system with corrupt incentives. Now think about, some people say today there's a similar system. People from New York City are put in prison, they're often non-white, and they're put in prison in upstate New York, and they sometimes, and the question is, are they gonna count 
and for, for state legislative purposes or congressional legislative purposes in upstate New York rather than are they going to count for New York City where they came from and will return to. And if so, and many of them are non-white, they aren't being allowed to vote, but they're actually increasing the voting power of the guard, the prison guards and the overseers in the prison industrial complex who are in these upstate places. Now, New York has actually adopted, I think, some rules saying you, they get to count in their, um, in their home jurisdiction rather than where they're warehoused. But Texas doesn't have those rules. And what? Right, and the, but the question is, are you going to count them as Elmira people, which they really aren't? They ch chose, did not ever choose to be in Elmira, or are you going to count them as... And I think New York actually recently adopted a rule that doesn't allow Elmira to count them, but Texas doesn't have such a rule. So they are counting both for state legislative districts and for congressional districts in the places that they're being warehoused, not at three-fifths, but at a full one-for-one. So some people say this is the new three-fifths clause. Was there any special effort to uh, abolish the Electoral College after the Civil War? No, not to my knowledge. Um, the main movements to uh, abolish the Electoral College kind of came in the 1960s as part of a whole bunch of egalitarian reform movements. First, I'd like to make a point that counting population isn't only about votes, it's also about money and where the money goes. And that's, an enormous, that's a source of enormous contention state by state within the state. So Congress has chosen, it doesn't have to and there's nothing in the Constitution that requires this, but the census that's done every 10 years is used constitutionally to determine how many seats in the House of Representatives in the Electoral College each state is entitled to. The Constitution says that. Every 10 years you do a census, and on the basis of that census, that de determines how many seats any given state, say New York, has in the House of Representatives and the Electoral College. But by statute, and only by statute, but he's reminding us a really important statute, Congress has also said that those census numbers often determine how much federal money each jurisdiction gets for all sorts of other purposes. The Constitution doesn't say that, but congressional statutes say that. They use the census for all sorts of other purposes. If I may, you were talking about how the states could compete in terms of getting more people to vote. The problem these days is we're getting is that the states are competing to make Fewer people vote. Some states are. Yeah. Uh, in Texas, somehow, uh, you've got a concealed carry permit is a good idea for uh, getting voter registration. But a state issued student ID is not correct. The state of Wisconsin, I forget which um, state, uh, which uh, county said, we don't want to have um, a voting booth. In, uh, at the university because those people are Democrats. Correct. And so today one party, the Republican Party, tends to have incentives to try to discourage turnout because it tends to lose in higher turnout elections and tends to, to win in lower turnout elections. So, and that incentive is going to exist even in a Mars direct election world. It's going to be an incentive in tension with the incentive to make Wisconsin count for as much as possible by having as many Wisconsinites vote as, as possible. But, but there are partisan incentives today in which one party tends to be the Republican Party tries to discourage voting in certain areas, uh, by certain segments of the population. Uh, students are one, um, um, uh, uh, non-whites are another. Yes, that is true. Um, there's a change.org petition now with more than four and a half million signatures uh, demanding that the electoral college electors uh, go against the, uh, the winner take all rule in the states. And instead of, instead of going that, they vote against Donald Trump. What's your view on that? That there was a time to show up and demand stuff, and it was called Election Day. And with due respect, my, my side didn't show up. 
um, and your generation, with due respect, didn't show up, and now you understand how important it is to show up at the right time. You can say whatever the heck you want, it will mean nothing at all, unfortunately. And here's why. Because who are the people that you're, you know, this is like my kids demanding things, well, you know, or my students, they can demand all they want, they, they, have, no, they have no power, they have no authority, and who gets to make the decision? Well, in my household, that would be me, because I pay the bills, not my kids, because they don't, you know? Um, so they can demand to their heart's content, but, you know, they um, are not masters of that domain. Now, um, who are going to be the decision makers? The electors. Who are the electors? They are people who are pledged to vote for Donald Trump. They're people who disagree with you and me. They like the fellow. They, they are proud, they were, were proudly, proudly, um, um, uh, 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 pledged to him in 30 of the 50 states. State law actually purports to bind the electors to vote as pledged. And in the other states, they are, are happy to do so in general. They're picked by Trump and the Republican Party. So why would they go against their views and their pledges? They're not remotely going to do that. It's never going to happen. You know, and and, and I don't know how many of these lectures you were at before, but I promise you many of the people here know that, that I opposed Donald Trump about as openly and, and you know, emphatically as it was possible, but all that was decided on election day, and we lost. Oh, by the way, just on that, if you want to see a little bit more, read a piece in Vox.com by, I think his name is Andrew, and then his last name is something like P-R-O-K-U-P, -P or something like that. It appeared about a week ago, um, and explaining why the electors are, oh, and by the way, just let me see, just a little, Barack Obama has acknowledged that Donald Trump is the next president of the United States, even though the Electoral College hasn't met, and Hillary Clinton has acknowledged that, and every foreign leader has acknowledged that, and every media outlet has acknowledged um, that, and so it's, it's just, I think, impossible to imagine that that's gonna, that gonna be undone. And he didn't win by three electoral votes or four electoral votes such that they only need four people to, to change their mind. You'd have to get dozens of people to change their mind and to really make a difference, they'd have to vote for Hillary Clinton, which they are never gonna do. Um, um, uh, so he's the, he's the guy who ran and won. And there was a time to stop him and it was called election day and we didn't do it. So we have to wait till the next election. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed it, so if you're ready to explain this, but um, if we did transition to a direct public vote, what, what is it exactly that incentivizes states to get more people to vote? I understand why Democrats would want that, but I don't see why the states would care. suppose you actually, just for a second, were a government official and you actually cared about what was good for your state rather than your party. I know there are not maybe that many of those folks, but well, but, but imagine there are a few, or imagine there are not that many, but there are newspapers in the state that aren't Republican, aren't Democrat, but just believe in good government and promoting the interests of our state, who can create some pressure. So, so in a state where lots of people turn out to vote, that state is looming larger in the national popular vote. So you're giving the candidates, um, the, uh, um, uh, you're, uh, they are going to pay attention to um, your state more if your state has more voters. Um, and so if you don't care about the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, but just care about your state, and again, there might not be lots of those people, but they might be the swing people in Albany or in um, some other state capital or the swing voters who are paying attention to you know, who's actually promoting the interests of the state and who isn't. Any state that, that has a big turnout in the election is playing a bigger role in the election and that's just better for the state. That is in tension with, and this was the first comment by my friend um, here, 
the interest, perhaps, of one party that tends to favor a lower turnout. Um, uh, so, but now, if it favors a lower turnout, it's hurting the state to some extent. The state is playing less of a role in the national popular vote, and now the members of that party are more vulnerable to press criticism, to the League of Women Voters, to all sorts of NGOs who are saying, what the heck, you're not only now helping your own party, you're hurting our state in the same way that a state might say, you know, if a state says, we don't want any federal money for our program or something, people can say, wait a minute, you're hurting our state. You're, you're not, you're leaving money on the table that otherwise could flow to our state. So I've read that um, there's constitutional reasons why the president is not subject to conflict of interest and does not have to disclose um, that much about his finances or put his holdings in a blind trust or in a trust. I just wondered if that was true. Well, various statutes apply to cabinet officers and to lower level officials, um, um, but in, in the name of democratic choice have not purported to apply to the President of the United States. Now, our traditions until now have been, ever since Richard Nixon, that anyone running for president has to make his or her financial information um, if you want to, uh, available to us. If you want to be seriously considered for the president, you have to give us your tax returns. Every presidential candidate, major presidential candidate since Richard Nixon has followed that. This guy didn't. That was one of many reasons I opposed him. One of many reasons that I thought it was a disgrace that the American people themselves were not demanding access to this information. But instead, what did our press do? It covered the emails, which were a bullshit story of Hillary Clinton's, rather than the absence of tax returns, which were a massive story every day. But they failed us in not reminding us every day. And maybe it wouldn't have made a difference. But every day, they should have been reminding us yet another day in which we do not have the information um, from this candidate that we've had from every major candidate for the last 40 years since Richard Nixon. But people are allowed to vote however they like, and they, they voted for him, notwithstanding, they voted for a pig and a poke, you know, without knowing the extent of his financial conflicts of interest. Now, what can be done going forward? If I were advising him, I'd say, listen, you own the world now. Do you really need, so what if it's, if you have one billion or two billion or five billion, you know, you're going to die anyway and your kids have more than enough, cash it all out, sell everything, put it in U.S. Treasury bonds you, and, and insulate yourself from the criticism that you're otherwise going to, you know, but, he, but so, and I would do that. As a friend, you know, if I were his friend, if I were an advisor, now he w might not want to take that advice. Um, but um, if he did such a thing, I think actually um, it would boost his popularity. It would be a very smart political thing to do. Um, it would, uh, he's, he already did one thing that I think was sound. He settled this Trump University thing. So what if he paid more than he had to? Um, so. The same idea would be cash out everything. Just sell it all over the course of a year and put, all, put it all in, in T-bills. Yeah. Um, and, and yes, you won't maximize your return. That's what you, you know, that's called sacrifice. It's called virtue. It's called putting country first. George Washington, you know, would have understood it. Um, there's been this idea that apparently the entire media has seized upon the past two weeks that this was an election um, largely based on a, a rural vote. A rural vote? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I was wondering if you could just give your opinion on uh, how exactly that played into this election in a way that, in a more prominent way than it apparently has in any other recent election, and why exactly the Democrats failed so spectacularly to capture that. Yeah, a lot of people who voted for Barack Obama twice um, or a significant portion of people in places like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan voted for Donald Trump. A lot of people who didn't vote in the last two elections came out this time, who didn't vote for Romney because he didn't give them enough of a reason to vote, didn't vote for McCain, voted this time. Um, some political scientists say it's because Donald Trump really primed people in certain ways. He, this was a more tribal election 
than any that we've had before. What tribe do you belong to? Do you belong to the, the white um, native rural tribe? Do you belong to the, the tribe of, of professors? Do you belong to the tribe of city dwellers, to the tribe of, of, of immigrants and intellectuals? So, so he brought out folks, according to at least some of the data that I've been looking at, who didn't vote in the last two elections. That's one thing that he did. He brought out um, uh, he got, got some people, so-called Reagan Democrats, blue-collar, um, uh, um, native-born whites, who actually did vote for uh, Barack Obama once or twice um, to um, uh, vote for him. Um, she did not bring out um, the entirety of the Obama coalition. She got a fair percentage of black to vote for her, maybe the same, um, the, the same percentage turnout um, of, of whites, but Barack Obama got a higher percentage of blacks than whites to turn out, and that didn't happen for um, her. Um, she, she, um, uh, millennials did not actually come out in um, the same numbers um, as came out for Barack Obama, so Obama didn't fully deliver his coalition. And I actually think historians are going to actually have to apportion a significant um, amount of that blame to Obama. It's not just Hillary Clinton's loss. This is Barack Obama's loss. He didn't hand over um, the, you know, the coalition. Um, I think Bernie Sanders, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, can be faulted for um, uh, uh, um, getting millennials um, excited about him but then not fully uh, hand, you know, handing off um, that, that coalition to her. He, Bernie Sanders stuck around too long and said too many negative things. Um, uh, um, if you're just asking me as a political scientist to sort of analyze um, you know, who all deserves blame for the loss, well, Hillary Clinton and all of her advisors and uh, Barack Obama and Bernie Sanders and the voters who didn't show up and then want to um, talk about now what can we do because we have four million people signing a petition, many of whom you didn't vote on election day. You know, that, that was the time to show up, dude. Um, so, um, uh, uh, um, uh, but the demographic coalition uh, that showed up is a coalition that's um, not ascendant. These, many of these are actually shrinking um, uh, uh, subpopulations. Um, uh, they're uh, uh, older Americans um, and, uh, and white Americans, um, but America's population, just if you look at the longer term demographic patterns, higher percentage of non-whites, higher percentage of college graduates, just, you just project into the future, higher percentage of, of women voters. So this, this, you know, this coalition could maybe win one more national, I've always thought this coalition had one or two, po uh, the Trump coalition, one or two possible presidential victories left in them, but not four or five or six unless they, they um, uh, um, adjust their, 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 their demographic formula. I read something recently about the reference to human relation to the emoluments clause. Yes. Zephyr Teachout had a piece in, uh, recently, um, um, and the emoluments clause of the Constitution says that um, officers of the United States can't receive gifts from foreign powers without congressional permission. Now, Zephyr and I and everyone else thinks that applies to the president. There is a, a, a response to her. This was, again, in the New York Times Room for Debate by Seth Barrett Tillman, who said, oh, that doesn't apply to the president, just to, just to secretaries of state and everyone else. I'm like, why would you have this rule apply to secretaries of state in the Constitution and not the president himself? So um, he actually quoted me in the piece by name, but my position is with Zephyr's that, of course, the president is subject to these um, conflict of interest rules. But note what the, the Constitution says, Congress can authorize all of this. And, and the Congress is controlled by Donald Trump's party. So they might pass a statute um, saying perfectly okay for him to have all these um, business dealings with foreign governments. 
and he'll sign that into law, and there's a question whether you, the voters, are going to think that's stinky or not. Um, and, you, uh, and that will matter because if you think it's stinky, Congress might not pass it because if you think it's stinky enough that you're going to vote against Congress people who voted for that law two years from now, that might discourage Congress from passing such a law. But yes, there is a clause in the Constitution that does say that um, uh, officers of the United States are not allowed to receive certain gifts um, from uh, foreign governments without the consent of Congress. Here's the clause. It's in Article 1, Section 9, the last paragraph, saying, no person holding any office of profit or trust under the United States, under them, but them means the United States, and I would think that's the precedent, although Seth Barrett Tillman thinks otherwise, but I don't. No person holding any office of profit or trust under the United States shall, without the consent of the Congress, accept any present, present emolument, office, or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. Now, if it's just a foreign company, maybe that's different, but many of these foreign companies are um, um, state-run operations. They really are foreign governments, um, and, and that clause would apply. So that's an answer to your question? Okay. <laughs> Nobody, uh, and certainly uh, our president-elect, uh, knows enough people to quickly hire, uh, say, 4,000 uh, replacements. Excellent is there, point. Is there, is there anything in the law uh, or tradition that requires all these Democrats to be fired and replaced by Republicans? And I think at the top it is our tradition that, that uh, about 4,000 people nowadays um, uh, clear out when a new president comes to town. That actually is our tradition. Um, there are many thousands of lower level faithful civil servants. You know, the, the snide term for them is bureaucrats, but they're earnest, faithful public servants who often could be making more money in the private sector. They're, they're, they're good, decent, hard-working prosecutors and public defenders and, and, and uh, uh, lawyers and teachers, and they're just all sorts of people in every department um, at lower levels, and they stay. That's the civil service, and they're protected by statutes, the Pendleton Act and the Hatch Act, from political reprisals. That's the lower levels of the bureaucracy. But at the highest levels, the cabinet officers, the deputy and assistant cabinet officers, those are political appointees, and there are about 4,000 in number. So, so you, you picked, you, you know the number. That, there was, that, that wasn't just plucked out of a hat, who typically um, come in when a new administration comes in. And that's by tradition. Now, here's one important thing to note. If the Senate is controlled by the party opposite the incoming president, that's a possible check. That doesn't exist here because Donald Trump carried the Senate as well. In all of American history, let's take at the very highest uh, level, the cabinet, the first time any president is basically told by the Senate, you can't have this cabinet officer at the beginning of, of his administration. First time that ever happens in American history is John Tower, which is very recent um, for Secretary of Defense. So there is a strong tradition, it's called the honeymoon period, in which for executive branch positions, especially the high ones, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and so on, presidents typically get their picks even from Congress of the other, even from Senate of the other party. That's our tradition. Okay, it's a tradition, but it's not, there's nothing in the law. Well, there isn't anything in the law, but there is something in the politics, which is, who are these electors? They're picked by Trump, they're not gonna vote against Trump. Who are these senators? They're members of the Trump party that rallied around Trump, they're going to give him what he wants because he's the man with the mandate. They're, you know, and they're, they're not so many of them. They're going to they want to step up to him. Now, because they don't have an overwhelming majority in the Senate, 
it's possible to imagine three senators saying no, Susan Collins, Ben Sass, Jeff Flake or something. That's possible. Are they gonna say no to Jeff Sessions, who's a member of the Senate it, it, uh, itself, uh, an alum of the Senate? I'm pretty skeptical that they're gonna do that. Um, so, they, and, and historically, they haven't done that. Uh, if, he, if he's his own man, and he wants the best man to, to be on his job, and one whose experience uh, would qualify him to continue, and he's never been an act of politics, He's just not done his job. Uh, it seems to me he, he you know, he's, he's not a conventional guy. Right. He, 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 he. But he did win, and he's the head of his party, and his party is, gonna, is highly unlikely to, to take him on and tell him who he can and can't have in his administration. And just as a matter of political science, I'd be surprised if that happened. Uh, you talk about the the way that you find the word mandate in this class before you just use it now. Uh, given that uh, Donald Trump didn't win the popular vote and, and um, given how uh, many people seem to oppose him, uh, do you think that he has uh, a mandate by your Yes, a good point. Is you no. Know, on the one hand, he didn't win the popular vote. Remember, on the other hand, that wasn't the game. The game was to win the electoral um, college, and he won uh, uh, actually, and not by a squeaker. Um, uh, so, um, uh, you're living in a world where um, we have polls all the time and approval polls, and, and here are the two points. It is true that a president who's doing well in the polls has more political capital and is maybe more likely to get stuff that he wants from um, uh, uh, Congress than someone who's low in the polls. So. On the one hand, that is true. On the other hand, there's only one poll that really matters and it's on election day and everything else is bullshit, okay? And, and this, this, these 4, 000, 4 million people signing a petition, it means nothing and the poll, because you know what? Those frickin' polls were wrong. So, um, um, uh, here's what he does have. He comes in with more political power than Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan did not win the House of Representatives. Donald Trump did. He won the House and the Senate, and he will fill that vacancy on the Supreme Court, and it's gonna, there'll be five Republican appointees on the court. So Ronald Reagan didn't have the House of Representatives. He had Republicans who were a minority and some Reagan Democrats that as a practical matter gave him a working coalition. He did not have a Republican majority in the House of Representatives. Ronald Reagan didn't. Um, and Barack Obama had two years of having the House, the Senate, the presidency, but he never had the Supreme Court. And um, uh, George W. Bush did have for a while the House, the Senate, the Supreme Court, and he got a lot of stuff done. Um, when he had that, that mandate. So you, you can say, and it's a fair point, and I've made it, that he didn't win the popular vote, so what kind of mandate did he have? On the other hand, the game isn't winning the popular vote, it's winning the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court, and he won all of those in addition to the presidency. So that's a lot of formal power. That, those are the people that are making the decisions, not people signing a petition or people who are registering their views in a preference poll. That's much softer than who controls the Senate, whether it's Chuck Schumer or Mitch McConnell. That matters a lot, and it's not Chuck Schumer. You know? And who's, the head, who's running the House of Representatives, whether it's Paul Ryan or Nancy Pelosi, and it's not Nancy Pelosi. And who's doing the assigning in the Supreme Court, whether it's John Roberts or Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and it's not Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you see? So, so that, that, and I told you that at our first lecture. I said, this was an election possibly for all the marbles, because for the first time since 1864, one party could have House, Senate, Judiciary, and Presidency, or the other party could have. Raise your hands if you remember my saying that at the first lecture, okay? I told you that that's why, you know, this was important, and we lost. We got our butts kicked. So there we have it. Um, so mandate is a softer term, but as a practical matter, who's making these decisions? It's the electors, and they're never going to turn against Trump. It's 
the Senate, and it's controlled by Mitch McConnell, who wants Trump to sign all the bills that Mitch McConnell, you know, wants to pass, uh, wants to enact. It's Paul Ryan, who made his deal with Donald Trump long ago, knowing exactly what he was doing, and history will judge him, and God will judge him, okay? <laughs> but for now, he's the guy, he is the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and Nancy Pelosi isn't, and that's the game. And that's why people had to show up on Election Day, and one side did, and one side didn't. Uh, there was an op-ed piece of the day of the Times that argued in a way I didn't quite understand, that the Supreme Court decision that allowed the internment of uh, Japanese, mm -hmm. uh, that is being used as, uh, as a possible precedent for the National Registry of Muslims, is in some way a bad decision that isn't really precedent. Could you comment on that? Yes, the opinion, uh, the op-ed is by um, a Professor Noah Feldman of the Harvard Law School, a very distinguished uh, scholar, one of my former students um, and, and friends. He, in fact, actually, when I wrote a book a long time ago, um, this title was America's Constitution, and I couldn't quite think of a, a subtitle, an introduction, an overview. He said, call it a biography. It'll sell more copies. And I took his advice, and he probably doubled the sales of the book. So thank you, Noah. He's a, he's a, a very clever fellow. And the question that he focused on is, what is the status of this case called Korematsu, which was about internment of Japanese um, Americans and uh, um, uh, Japanese aliens in World War II, um, they were required, 100,000 of them, to vacate the West Coast and to, and to uh, move to these relocation centers, um, um, which um, critics called like concentration camps, and, and they were not nice places, and they were surrounded by barbed wire. And the Supreme Court upheld the forced evacuation of Japanese Americans and Japanese aliens. It never strictly, strictly, strictly upheld the, the order that required them to go to these, uh, to, to um, move to these relocation centers. Strictly speaking, all the court did is upheld the order that they had to leave their homes on the West Coast. But that was still a pretty drastic intrusion into civil liberty and equality. Korematsu was a wartime decision um, uh, World War II was still um, um, uh, happening, uh, and it, the Supreme Court upheld these policies. The question Noah was asking is, is Korematsu still a valid precedent? On the one hand, it has never been formally overruled. On the other hand, more so than just about any other case, it's been savagely criticized, including by justices themselves, although in what's called dicta, in, 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 um, in sentences that weren't part, um, that, that, that didn't involve the formal overruling of the case. And Noah said, most people think that Korematsu is no longer, you know, a valid case. And that's what he, why does it matter? Because that would be the best precedent were President Trump to want to establish, for example, a registry of Muslims in America or um, um, a set of rules about um, um, Muslim immigrants or even immigrants from Muslim-dominated countries or countries on a certain um, uh, uh, terrorism watch list. Korematsu um, would be um, a case saying, gee, if, if President Roosevelt could do all of these things in World War II in order to prevail. Why can't President Trump do all these things um, uh, in order to win a war on terror? So Noah Feldman's op-ed is basically saying, well, even though Korematsu is still formally on the books and not overruled, the justices have, in effect, already signaled it's not, uh, that, that, that they think it was wrongly decided or shouldn't no longer be followed. So, but they've never squarely held that in a case, and that's what Noah Feldman's op-ed was all about. I agree with him that the court has never overruled Korematsu. I agree with him that the justices uh, many of them have actually gone out of their way to criticize Korematsu um, uh, and um, uh, 
What would today's Supreme Court do? Well, that in part depends on who's on today's Supreme Court, and Donald Trump is about to actually weigh in on that. He's about to pick someone, and, um, and, um, and once confirmed, that person owes Donald Trump nothing at all, but it owes the rest of us her or his best independent judgment. What I would say is don't be surprised if the Korematsu question is featured front and center in the confirmation hearings, and don't be surprised if the candidate ducks the question and says, I'm not going to answer that because it might come before me. Um, if some elected officials, including senators, once in office, are awarded a salary for life, and they vote raises for themselves, and they have preferential health care and other advantages that we citizens don't, this seems to me like it's a broken part of our system. Could you comment on what we can do about fixing that? Well, you can always vote the bums out of office if you don't like them. I don't begrudge them, but, but I don't begrudge them salaries. Because if, if we don't compensate our public servants um, uh, um, uh, comfortably, then only the rich people can actually serve in government. Donald Trump says, I'm willing to forego the $400,000, but, um, but Barack Obama might not have been able to say that because he doesn't have enough money um, when he was running eight years ago to pay for his kids' high, sc uh, high school or college. So, so I do not begrudge them, um, uh, and it, sound, it sounds very populous. Why are they making you know, lots of money more than the average citizen? I'll tell you actually honestly why, because because if they weren't in Congress, they could like make a lot more money than the average citizen. Um, uh, and because uh, they ha could uh, have uh, well-paying law practices and, and well-paying sort of a business opportunities. So I don't begrudge paying uh, lawmakers. Um, it's a great democratic reform, I believe. Um, England doesn't start doing that until 1911. But if you don't pay your public servants, then only the wealthy can serve. So, so I think it's false economy to not pay them. Well, I'm a public servant. I work for the New York City Department of Education. And I'm not paid very well. I know, but it's, hard, it's harder to become a member of the House or the Senate than it is your job. And just supply and demand, I just got to be straight with you. It's, you know, it is much harder to get one of those jobs than it is to get your job. I just, I, I know what I said was not politically correct. I'm not pandering to you, but I'm actually, you know, being straight with you. Because I, uh, you know, I know what other jobs they could get, and they could get jobs that pay way more than their senatorial salaries. And I'm not sure with due respect that you could. So it's wrong for you at some level. You know, it's just false populism for you to quite compare because you don't have the job prospects that some of them. So I know these people. There's, there's some peop there were people I went to school with, and, and here's what their spouses tell them. You're a chump because you're working, you know, for this amount. You're a judge. Judges get $200,000 a year. And then here's what the spouse says. Amar was your classmate, and he's getting paid more than you are. And what's up with that? You know, you're smart as he is. And your law clerks are getting paid more than you are after two years, and what's up with that? And all your other classmates are getting paid more than you are. And if you stepped down, you could be a partner at some firm. Um, so, uh, and we got to pay for our kids' college. We've got three kids, and they're going through college. And so, so, uh, tr so either you say only the independently wealthy can serve, or you pay them well enough. And the awkward thing is, well enough is going to be more than the average Joe is getting paid, more than the average citizen. Here was my proposal, by the way, because the judges think they're underpaid. And the judges are getting $200,000 a year. And that's way more than an ordinary American. Okay, so it looks, so for ordinary Americans, they say, what the hell are you talking about? That's $200,000 a year. And the spouse is saying, you could make 400, 500, you know, uh, um, as an arbitrator, um, as a, a, a partner in any New York firm, which would be happy to have you as a former judge. Just step down tomorrow. You're getting so their baselines are: what are your classmates getting? Your law school classmates getting paid? What were you getting paid before you took this ju judicial job? What could you get paid after you step down from this judicial job? What are your law clerks getting paid? So. So there's a disconnect. From their point of view, they're not being paid so much. 
from an ordinary citizen's point of view, man, they're getting paid way more than the rest of us. That's what you said. Did you go to law school? Because they did, and they had to forego three years of income for that and pay a ton of money, and it's not easy to get into these places. So, see, so it's not quite, I'm being rude but blunt when I say, no, actually, there's a difference. Now, what's my solution? My solution is we should pay judges and we should pay them by imposing a surtax on wealthy lawyers. Every lawyer who makes more than a judge, that is, makes more than $200,000, should pay an extra 2% um, um, of their income, uh, and that money would pay for our Fed. And I did the back of the envelope math, and it, and it works out. And ordinary people love it because they hate lawyers. But the truth is, the lawyers are just going to raise their fees a little bit. It'll be diffused throughout the economy. It's a tax on the rest of you, but it looks politically, you know, you know soaking the rich, going after the lawyers. Um, um, but, um, and lawyers really are the, the people who most of all should appreciate why we want really good people to be judges. Because the lawyers know the difference between a hack judge and a good judge. And it should want all sorts of good people. But I promise you, Many, many people refuse to be judges because they don't want to take the pay cut. It's just a hassle. You know, all the conflict of interest forms and the, the paperwork you have to file. So there are all sorts of people who would be excellent public servants who won't do it because we make it hard. And, and yes, they're going to get paid more than you do, but that's because if they're not judges, they can get paid more than you do. And that's just, that's the reality. And so you have to decide, do you want those folks to be your judges or not? And, and likewise, I remember when you said that uh, you do know a lot of people who could be very good candidates in public office, but they don't want to be scrutinized yes. in their personal life. And yes. um, I think that's very valid. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if anyone who, now, I do think that if you want to be present, you have to give us your tax returns. That's, you know, what the standard has been since Richard Nixon. If you want to be present, do we have to look at every email you've ever sent? I wouldn't want ordinary people looking at every email I've ever sent or received, so that seems unduly intrusive. Um, tax returns, and, and I was nominated for a position. I'm never going to get confirmed. I'm going to die you know, on the vine on January 20th. Um, but I had to give them like six years of tax returns. And just, it took me weeks to fill out all the forms. But you know, I believe in public service, so I was willing. And it was for a position that paid zero. You know, but, but it was the, no, it was, it was public service. And there are lots of people who are willing to do that. But if this is your full-time job and you have to give up your law firm job um, in order to be a judge, and of course you do, and your law firm job pays you $500,000 a year, and your judge's job pays you $200,000, your wife, and it's often the spouse, is going gonna, is gonna to have a talking to you about that. And it's not going to be so easy to persuade your spouse that you should do this. I'm telling you, because lots of my friends who are judges have candid conversations with me about you know, uh, their lives. If we pay judges $50,000, Lots of people won't do it because they can make so much more, and they 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 still have to pay their law school um, debt. You know, they have massive debt from college and law school. If we pay them two hundred thousand dollars, that seems fair. They can they can make a living. Um, if you're on the Supreme Court, I get it. But two hundred thousand dollars if you're on a federal district court, which, you know, when you could be a partner at a New York law firm and your spouse is saying, we've got to pay the, you know, we've got all sorts of bills to pay, we've got health expenses, my, we have to take care of my elderly um, mother. Um, um, so I'm being straight with you. Um, uh, and if you don't pay judges, well, if, again, if you're independently wealthy, you don't have to worry about these things. I don't want the people to, I don't want only independently wealthy people to serve as judges. So that's why I want to want to pay them enough so that they can actually earn a comfort. Oh, and here's another thing: earn a comfortable li li living without ever, ever, ever being tempted to take a bribe. Ah, because if they feel actually, and they some of them do, this isn't you know the, I'm doing all this for my country, and no one no one really appreciates the service I'm doing. And I say, don't give me that. You're being paid well. It's true you could get paid more, but you have a very decent, honorable salary, and it's good enough in a republic. So the question is, what number is that? Is it $50,000 for a judge? 
Is it $100,000 for a judge? Is it $200,000 for a judge? That's what you have to decide as a society. Um, but I don't think it's $50,000, uh, even though that's what it is for a school teacher. What do you think Obama could have done differently to deliver his coalition? Uh, spent every day of the last three months camped out um, um, with Joe Biden in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, listening to and talking to all sorts of Americans, uh, many of whom are not rock stars or um, Hollywood stars. Um, um, so he's way too much time with Bruce Springsteen and Beyonce and Jay-Z and way too little time actually with the folks who elected him twice. With the benefit of hindsight, you know. Um, um, uh, um, so that's my answer. He did not under act as if he was on the ballot for a third time, but he was. And everything that he did is at risk of being undone. And he didn't act, I think, with the urgency um, that, with the benefit of hindsight, was warranted. Okay, next week, Obamacare. <laughs>